Welcome uh, to this very special edition of Chat with Chair. Uh, we have today a very interesting uh, sector, which all of us normally use, and this is the civil aviation uh, sector. And we are delighted that we have the chair of the Civil Aviation Committee of Hickey, Mr. Remy Maliard, with us uh, today. Uh, he is president of Airbus India and head of South Asia. He is responsible for the Airbus commercial aircraft sales and business development in the South Asia region. He manages uh, Airbus's regional footprint, including engineering, uh, innovation, customer support, IM services, and training. He also uh, drives the Airbus's top defense and helicopter campaigns and Make in India uh, program. He has previously headed Airbus uh, services and played a key role in the development of the helicopter programs as a chief uh, engineer. So obviously he has engineering background and now he is actually uh, leading Airbus in India. Welcome, uh, Rennie, uh, to this uh, chat with Chair. Um, if I can just go straight into the uh, first uh, uh, you know, question. I think the civil aviation sector is uh, among the sectors that are actually facing the maximum brunt of the present crisis. In fact, uh, you know, a good indicator is understanding how the terminals operate and you know, terminals in Delhi are closing because the passenger load is not there. So what is your understanding of the impact of both the waves of COVID, the first wave and wave two, on the aviation sector, and how do you see the next few months? Well, thank you for inviting me to this important discussion about uh, the aviation sector. Well, yes, the hit the aviation sector took with the second wave of the COVID pandemic needs no elaboration. It's, a, it's very much an existential crisis for the sector. The first wave last year left us wounded. But thanks to people faced in air travel, the strength, the resilience of our airline operators, we started to recover domestic traffic up to 60% of pre-COVID level back in March. We also saw some uh, international traffic movement under the Bande Bharat mission and the bilateral air bubble agreements. The second wave of COVID has virtually reversed all the gains pushing the sector to the brink again. So even though air travel remains open this time, domestic uh, traffic has plunged to below 30%. And airlines are reporting about 50% load factor. 300 aircraft could be grounded. The Indian airlines are expected to report a loss of four to $5 billion for the year ending March 2021. And a similar figure of loss, if not worse, is expected this year as well. So we are looking now at the possibility of massive structural damage to the sector in terms of infrastructure, capacity exp expansion, fleet renewal, and employment generation. India is probably the only major economy in the world that has not announced any meaningful relief package for the aviation sector. Aviation, as you know, is a critical component of growth of an economy. You cannot have a strong economy without a strong aviation sector. And I'm confident that with the vaccination being rolled out, demand for both domestic and international travel will return. However, if we don't have any assistance from the government, I think the, the shock that our airlines, our airports, our MROs, and our allied industries are receiving now will structurally alter the shape of the sector. So yes, I'm concerned. That's, uh, you know, that's very interesting. And uh, you, know, you mentioned that Many other countries have done specific uh, actions for the aviation industry. Uh, could you share you know, some developed country examples, some developing country examples, and also then what could the government of India do for this sector? Well, I think most uh, of the countries have implemented actions to support the aviation industry. And I have in mind Europe, I have in mind the US, I have in mind most uh, of the major economies in the world. And we have listed out a number of actions needed to arrest uh, the slide, to revive one of the best performing sectors of the Indian e economy. And I think the time to take those measures is now, being financial measures or support to the vaccination 
or development of homogeneous international regulations. So this broad range of measures is available now and it's time to act now. Um, I would like as well to salute the, the courage and the dedication of all those that are associated with the aviation sector. And I think the way they have worked to keep air travel going in this situation is very much exemplary. And I would like to compliment the Ministry of Civil Aviation and the government of India for recognizing this and allowing the workforce in the aviation sector to receive the vaccination on priority. And I think this will further strengthen confidence in air travel. It's, it's quite important to emphasize that we have seen the critical role that the aviation sector played in times of a pandemic. I mean, from flying, uh, medical supplies, uh, taking them to different parts of, of the country, or bringing back Indians that were stuck abroad and more. So we have been, the aviation sector has been at the forefront of this fight, of this common fight that we have against COVID. I think in addition, you know, uh, if you can take the Indian Air Force uh, planes also as part of the aviation sector, they have been bringing in, you know, uh, cryogenic cylinders and other things from across uh, the world, including some uh, private uh, airlines have also been uh, taking uh, very good cargo here. But, you know, you mentioned the, 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 you know, the two waves. So what are some of the key learnings from the pandemic and what should be an action plan, you know, and, you know, taking all the stakeholders together, uh, you know, so that we can actually uh, anticipate and fight such uh, uncertainties in the future. Well, yeah, I think history has taught us that all challenges uh, come with opportunities. And I think this crisis is no different. Uh, I think this uh, crisis, the two waves uh, that we're talking about have forced behavioral changes uh, on us. And this should continue the way airports operate, the way passengers travel is different from the way it used to be, like a year back. We see a lot of uh, IT-based uh, services being introduced by airlines and at airports for seamless travel. So this is an area where more initiatives should be taken. Also, I think it is time for the long pending demand on bringing aviation turbine fuel and the ambit of GST is realized. The cost of ATF constitutes about 40% of the total operational cost of an airline. The aviation sector definitely can be strengthened by streamlining certain fees and taxation and starting with the ATF. Now, to, to go back to your point uh, about the, the key learnings and opportunities from the crisis, I think looking beyond the present crisis, there are many opportunities for the Indian aviation sector because the pandemic has altered the nature of our business in many ways. And I think it has offered an opportunity to refocus our efforts on turning India into an international air travel hub. Today, out of the international air traffic to India, only 36% goes to Indian carriers. Meaning time is right for Indian carriers to rescale their operations and gain control of the international network out of India. India today has about one-tenth of the white body fleet installed in similarly populated regions of the world. And we see a tremendous white body market opportunity in India. Just look at the number of white bodies coming every day to India. And it's a market Indian carriers are missing out on today and could compete for. Air travelers, I think, are also adapting to the COVID crisis they are showing a demonstrated preference for flying non-stop, point to point. And last but not least, maybe there's an opportunity on cargo. Through the COVID crisis, cargo has been one key stable source of revenue for airlines worldwide, not only in India. But India must build capacity to answer this demand on cargo that is presently quite relying on foreign carriers very interesting that you mentioned the number of aircraft that uh, the white-bodied aircraft that are coming into India and you know yet India is not a significant manufacturer of aircraft so what will it take uh, for India to either attract or develop or you know work with uh, major OEMs uh, in the world uh, to see uh, some kind of an establishment in India well you know the, the OEMs they do not 
operate in isolation and the performance depends very much on how fast the airlines are growing in the country, how swiftly airports are being built, how future ready the aviation sector is. I think as of, as of today, most aviation OEMs have major operational bases in the country because India offers the right mix of competencies and competitiveness. I believe that India is well placed today to play a leading role in the development of next generation aircraft, engines, and IT-based solution for the aviation sector. You know that the next breakthrough is the zero emission aircraft. That's, that's the future. This is what will sustain aviation beyond our lifetimes. And I think India, with a rich human resource, with our IT talent pool, we can join the effort to build this next generation aircraft, the zero emission aircraft. And this will certainly benefit with the development of an ecosystem back in India. Now that's a very positive uh, statement coming from you. And you know, you believe that the zero emission aircraft uh, lends a huge opportunity for India to lead the world. If I, you know, if I were to refer to the telecom sector, it is like moving from a landline to mobile phone. Uh, you know, we, we were laggards. Precisely, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I just want to take on the next thing, and this brings me to the whole issue of the MROs, right? And you know that uh, the finance minister mentioned in a budget speech uh, to make India a hub for maintenance, uh, repair, and overhaul, which is the common MRO format. Uh, in this context, what are you know what do you see uh, that further needs to be done here to you know translate that statement into a reality? Well, I believe first that there is a lot of potential for the MRO business to grow in India. And the government has taken major steps towards tax reforms for the sector, but some actions remain to be taken, such as exemption of GST on parts imported for the aviation sector, rationalization of the GCFE structure for MRO. So the industry needs a, a six month moratorium for royalty payments, revenue share, hand tolls payable for hangar or factory premises, and some others that are pending for quite some time. But if we are able to sort out these, then I think there's nothing to stop a significant growth of the MRO business in India. And definitely, we need a strong MRO industry to boost the development of the aviation sector in India. To this initiative, uh, this is all this initiative of you know, with the Gibbs City looking at leasing aircraft, and you actually participated in the event which was uh, done, you know, the finance ministry organized, and you know, Fiki helped in organizing that. So, what is it that needs to be done to make this whole leasing, uh, financing, and leasing, uh, you know, can we make it a hub? Uh, how can the government support this initiative? Well, despite. Uh, the challenges that are posed by the health pandemic, I think that the outlook for Indian aviation remains promising. And aviation financing is probably the next piece of our industry puzzle to fall into place. The ambition is quite bold. It is to take India from being a consumer of financial products to a producer of financial products when it comes to aircraft leasing. The International Financial Services Center Authority is there to take care of the complex regulatory coordination that financial business would require. We have started marching towards becoming a lucrative center for internal financial services, but I believe we still have a, a long way to go, but I'm sure investors will see a, a business case here and will be convinced like uh, all of us are, I suppose. So, both the uh, MRO and leasing, right, are, you know, are, could be a catalyst for the OEM's, uh, you know, market growth and presence in India. You know, do you think that there is something which we need to look at beyond uh, these two? How would the OEMs uh, look at this and how would they uh, uh, respond? And what is the synergy between the OEMs and the MRO uh, you know, uh, organizations and as well as the aircraft and leasing organizations. Well, you know, the, the OEMs and the, uh, and the MROs, uh, uh, they complement each other. They, they, don't, they don't compete uh, with each other. They complement uh, each other. I think we, the, the OEMs, they are committed to supporting the development of commercial aviation and related infrastructure in the country. We are pursuing the development of the Indian MRO ecosystem together with uh, local partners. For instance, uh, at Airbus, we 
we are permanently reviewing potential synergies with companies looking to enter the market. We have state-of-the-art digital solutions for aircraft maintenance and services that augment performance and efficiency of airline operators. I also see an immense potential in developing digital capabilities and aviation. When it comes to predictive maintenance, fleet performance, or trajectory optimization, you know, that's digital. I see that as the glue between the OEMs and the airports and the MROs and the training facility and uh, the, the financing investors we were talking about. That's the glue that puts the industry together. And we're only at the beginning of the digital revolution. The best is yet to come. So I think an important part of that glue, as you call it, uh, is people. And how yeah. are we placed in India in terms of the skill for people? You know, there's pilots, there are crew members, but there are maintenance engineers. There are, you know, other types of people, leasing, you know, leasing experts, MRO experts. So, you know, what could be done in that area? Well, until COVID hit, the forecast was that over the next 10 years, the rapid growth of India's aviation sector would drive demand for 250,000 additional staff. 250,000 across the industry, from pilots to um, cabin crew, engineers, uh, commercial, financial specialists, ground handlers, air traffic controllers, you name them. And even with COVID, there will be a huge shortage of captains and maintenance staff among others. Around 250 pilots are trained in India every year, whereas the industry needs as many as 900. So training academies are expanding the capacities to meet the rising demand for airlines professionals. For example, Airbus has been providing maintenance training from our center in, uh, in Bengaluru since 2007. And we have trained so far more than 3,000 maintenance engineers. In 2019, we inaugurated our own training center in, in Gurgaon next to Delhi. And we have now the capacity to skill more than 8,000 pilots over the next 10 years with plans for further expansion. So yes, people remains at the core of our industry and training our people will be critical to support the recovery and the future growth of civil aviation in India. I think I just want to take you back to you know, your whole thing about the uh, zero emission and you know all this developments happening in the sector. So you know, R&D is a very integral part of the civil aviation here. You know, how is India as a source uh, for R&D and what could we do to develop the R&D capability in India and how do we take it forward? Well, uh, I believe that India has a great advantage in terms of R&D and technology because it has an immensely rich talent pool like NOS. And today, much of global aviation is driven on technology developed in India. Historically, R&D in the Indian aviation sector remained uh, largely with the public sector. And I think we've seen a shift on this front in the recent years. And there is a momentum now from the private sector, and we need to amplify this momentum. Now, promoting R&D and technology in the private sector does not mean ignoring the rich experience of India public sector. I'm a firm believer that we need harmony and synergy between the two, the, the, two, the, the public and the private sectors. So, uh, you know, given uh, this whole uh, aspect of, you know, skilling about R&D and, you know, the whole sector, what are the opportunities that you think are there for international collaboration, uh, you know, uh, in these areas uh, going forward? You know, you mentioned your own training center, which you had initially in Bangalore and your Gurgaon training center. But what could, you know, what could government do to attract more uh, training institutions, uh, you know, R&D uh, organizations uh, into India? Well, we obviously need the right uh, aviation and aerospace environment in India. I think the government has been taking measures for the last uh, years. A lot uh, remains to be to be done, but uh, I strongly believe that India could be a home country in the development of the zero emission aircraft of the next generation aircraft, because there is everything in India. We can rely on a large uh, talent pool. I think we have investors, we have strong airlines, we have the best 
aircraft in the world. We have an MRO and a training industry that is being developed. We have the financing investors that are coming in India in the frame of the Gift City initiative. So I think holding into place, um, we have addressed uh, several recommendations to the government. Uh, they are very important uh, to address the short-term challenges and hurdles of our industry. And if we overcome the current crisis, well, we will be in the right position to take a leadership role in the aviation industry in the world. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and you know, under your leadership, we, we do a series of programs, whether it is the Civil Aviation Summit or Wings or, you know, or the Helicopter Summit. I think these are all opportunities for international organizations to get a pulse of what's happening in India and also to look at the opportunities in India. But, you know, one aspect which has been in the, you know, when you look at the civil aviation sector in India, one, one aspect that everybody's talking about now is the disinvestment of Air India and Power Hunts. What are your views on that? Well, um, my view is that I've always believed that the Maharaja of Indian aviation has a lot of potential to achieve his, uh, uh, its glory. And I believe that... Uh, you know, power nons as well, given its reach and the future demand projection, will play a significant role in the Indian, uh, in the Indian aviation story. Um, I think we remain committed to supporting the government disinvestment efforts and in assisting in any way that, uh, that we can. Uh, talking about power nons, I think there is one opportunity that I've not mentioned yet. It's the opportunity about helicopters. And I think uh, India is... Um, an ideal helicopter country given its size and also its topography. And uh, when we look at the current market, there are only 270-ish civil helicopters flying in the country. So this is less than 1% of the worldwide fleet. Uh, this is less than the number of helicopters operated in just one city like Sao Paulo. So I think demand needs to be accelerated by different measures like promoting the emergency medical services mission, but developing a central government policy on airborne law enforcement, uh, um, reworking the, the UDAN scheme, the reworking connectivity scheme to include the single engine helicopters, or obviously freeing up uh, the helicopter airspace. And I think all these measures will support uh, the, the future growth uh, of, uh, of power nuns, uh, for the coming years. Well, thank you, Remy, for that very fascinating discussion, of course, we started with the impact on the civil aviation sector and you know everybody knows what is happening there we've talked about the mro we've talked about leasing uh, we've talked about you know what the government could do in, in 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 the civil aviation sector especially the atf point that you mentioned we talked about rnd and i think uh, right throughout uh, the conversation uh, you always focused on the positive i mean the last comment you made that, you know, 1% of the helicopter uh, population in the world, you know, we need we, law enforcement, medical, and a huge opportunity uh, there. And of course, the single engine helicopter, which you talked about. And, I, and I, I believe that you firmly believe that the aviation sector, both in passenger and cargo, has a great future in India. The MRO and leasing has a great future in India. And even... Uh, you know, with the dis disinvestment going, the Maharaja will keep uh, flying and there's a great opportunity to expand uh, the helicopter business in India. And of course, you know, just making a pitch that, you know, it is really the Civil Aviation Summit, the Wings and the Helicopter Summit, which you have been so ably leading, uh, will get you more uh, on these uh, opportunities. So thank you very much for being with us uh, today and we wish you all the very best and let's hope that you know the aviation sector together we actually transform it into a leading sector in india and the world so thank you for being with us well thank you very much thank you very much for this discussion